I'm going to give you a crown of life. In other words, at the point of death, just be doing what we're supposed to be doing. Because they kill us, we get to a home world. Forgive us for sins, stress where we're weak, be our president, and help us always to love one another as you loved us. Because you said a new commandment I give you is you love one another as I have loved you. Really, there isn't any chapter breaks. He ends with this idea of uh, serving God with an attitude of... That's right. So there's where we left off. Since we have this wonderful access to God, and we get to live with God, and there's this new and living way. So he says, show gratitude, and they're all immersed in priest offering sacrifices for everything for sin, for Thanksgiving, you know, and all the grain offerings. And so here in, Christ, you know, in the Christian world, we offer sacrifices too. But are they material things? No, they're things that come from our hearts and from our life. And so he's going to give us a, a, a bullet list of things that is acceptable service to God. And we've been going through them, hospitality to strangers, visiting prisoners, and then last week we started marriage and we want to finish that. But we'll look at the, these things. These are all acts of service, of worship on an altar, if you would, sacrifices. Because each one requires something from us. But they all come from a heart of gratitude. All right? So gratitude says what when, you, you, when you're grateful? It says thank you. Okay, that's really what it does. It says, thank you, God. So the person that cannot say thank you to God for anything, what does that tell you about that person? Well, <laughs> stupid. All right. His perspective may be a little skewed, but what does he say about how he sees life? Well, huh? Selfish, that's getting where I want you to think. Entitled. Entitled, all right. Or else, does it describe a person that thinks that everything that he has and everything that he possesses and his security all depends upon? I've created my own life. I've created all my own security. I don't need to thank you, all right? Now, is that a lot of people in America? Well, in the world, generally. And so we wouldn't want to go there. But if we find ourselves not thanking God, it really displays that kind of attitude. Either I'm entitled, or I've done this on my own, and why do I owe to you? Or they just don't appreciate or understand what God has done for them and what uh, he's done for us in Christ. Okay? Yes. Yes. That's right. That's right. And so when we look at these sayings, it, the last thing that should come to our mind, do I have to? Because as soon as you think that, because you wouldn't say it in class, I know you wouldn't, what is that telling you, uh, God, and telling yourself? You're ungrateful. You don't get it. Because these don't come from an attitude, I have to, to be pleasing to God. No, the only way you can do them in a way that is pleasing, if you do it out of gratitude. You're so thankful. What can I do for you, Lord? And he says, well, if you're really grateful, start doing for others what I've done for you. So that's where we were. And so uh, it's how we can show acceptable service. Now, Another thing I want to share with you is going back to chapter 11 and verse 6, because all this ties together, and that was a verse some of you know by heart, 11.6, which says, Artie, what? Oh, thank you, Artie. It's the same first letter, A, but Ann. <laughs> no, that's right. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, put that in a positive statement. 
with faith. These are brand new markers, aren't they? <laughs> They're not working, are they? With faith, you can, you can please God. So the way we please God is coming from a place of faith. Now, Romans chapter 14 says uh, that the faith you have, have as your own conviction before God. And whatever you do, if you doubt, you have sinned. Because whatever is not of faith is sin. So we can have acceptable service to God if we're always acting from a, a place of faith. Well, what better way can we know what God wants us to do when he tells us? Right? He tells us, be hospitable to strangers. Visit those that are in prison. You know, that was a, a reference to Christians. And same thing when it comes with all these things about marriages and um, uh, teachers. Well, I actually, I left money out of there. So it's, it, it'd be, that's what two we're going to look at. So marriage is where we left off. Let marriage be held in honor by all. I have a chart, and I just, I'm not even going to go down that path, uh, the leading countries where divorce is the highest, and the United States is like in the fourth place, you know, and some Europe, Spain is number one, amazingly. Divorce rates highest in Spain anywhere. But we look in the Western world, Russia's up there too, so I won't even say the Western world. Is marriage held in honor by all? No, it's not. It, and we saw. Uh, some of the charts last uh, week, and we'll just review them real quickly. The majority of Americans now believe in living together. The Bible calls that uh, immorality. The old King James says fornication. They'd rather live together rather than, than marry. And uh, 65% agree. And, uh, and of course, the, the biggest group would be the millennials, of course, that would hold that. And you ask, why would you want to live together without getting married? The number one reason, 84%. Yeah, I mean, it's a pragmatic thing. You know, it's not about pleasing God or, or holding to an institution that they think is outdated. It's just whatever works for me. So let's try it. And if it works, maybe we'll get married later. All right? So it's interesting. The divorce rate is really um, skewed because... If you live with someone outside of marriage for two, three years and then separate and then join with somebody else, have you divorced that person? No. It doesn't show up on the divorce statistics, but actually the same thing has happened. So yes to you, but you're correct. All right? Sorry, Ann. <laughs> I'm sorry? All right. But you see what I'm saying? It's skewed because a lot of people, if they're foregoing marriage altogether, they can go from relationship to relationship, and we don't even know if, uh, how many have done so. And so it just starts, it's a spiral downward. Now, if they have children in the midst of all this, it's even worse, okay? And I left off with this. This is uh, the secular wisdom says that marriage impedes self-actualization. That's the interesting thing. But the last thing, a person sarcastic put it, love is temporary insanity. This is where we left off. Oh, I'm in love. And it's insanity. And the way you can cure it is what? Get married. All right. And that's sad. It's a sad outlook on what God says should be held in honor by all. Highly esteemed, okay? And so it's interesting. When you go to a hotel and they have a safe to lock up valuables when you leave the room, do you put your dirty socks in the safe? No. What do you put in there? Your wallet, perhaps, or your, your, your jewelry, or anything of value. Why? Because you honor it. And that's what marriage should be in our eyes as Christians. Honored. This is extremely valuable. We lock it up and safeguard it. We don't think about it lightly or apathetically. But that's so easy for it to happen in our lives. And that's why he says we have to be careful because when it comes to what's all said and done, the fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. 
Now, there's a difference between the two words. And he's not just being redundant, you know, using two words for the same thing. Fornication is um, defined, it's from the word which we get por, uh, pornography. It's pornos or pornia. And it's any unlawful sexual activity. Any unlawful sexual activity. So it's a more generic term. And under this umbrella of sexual immorality, because that's what New American Standard uses also for fornication, there's various sites, uh, uh, types of illicit sexual activity. One of them is adultery. And that's the second word he uses. And what is adultery? All right, it's sexual activity that's unlawful, but you have to be what? To be able to commit it. Married. Married. That's the only difference, all right? So if two people that are not married are having sexual activity, what do we call it? Adultery? We just call it immorality or fornication, all right? And so when you talk about um, any type of homosexual activity, whether there might not be, you know, typical sex relationships, that would fall under the broader term of, you know, sexual immorality or anything illicit. How about pornography? Is that an illicit, in God's eyes, sexual activity? Okay. So there's lots of things that would fall under here, okay? And the Bible even had to talk about bestiality and all sorts of things. And so you can imagine how wide that umbrella is, okay? Now, why does he say all that and put it there? Well, because there's ways you can honor marriage, and there's ways you can defile it. Because he says, let it be held in honor, and let the marriage bed be undefiled. Now, in postmodern world, where there are no truths, uh, there are no more absolutes, so they would uh, reject everything we put on the board because you're judging and you're trying to uh, project your value system on others, and there is no truth. If you were enlightened, you would know that. And yet, when it comes to morals, you say, well, how do you define them? It's all based on your emotions, your feelings. Well, I feel it's okay for me, so it's now your personal truth. That God holds us to a different standard because he's a creator of all things. So what are some ways in which we can defile the marriage bed or the sexual act? Because that's what the marriage bed is a euphemism for. It's the sexual union that's supposed to take place in marriage. How can we defile it? Because he says, let it be undefiled, unstained. It, that word is used of Jesus earlier in the book of Hebrews that he was without stain or blemish, okay? How can you defile it? First of all, any sex before marriage defiles the marriage itself. Why? Why would we say that? So this is two people that have lived together or just have sex on occasion, whatever. They're defiling marriage. How come? How, why would we say that? All right, because to value or honor marriage, you're saying, I will s wait until I am married to have sexual activity because it is a blessing of the marriage union. It's not something to prove your love or to find out if you're in love. It's a blessing for those people that are already married because of their love. It's not a way to discover love. It's a blessing for those people that have joined themselves together in marriage. And so when people choose to have sex relationships outside of marriage, they're defiling marriage itself. They're saying it's really not that important. It's really not really worth waiting for. Do you see what I'm saying? How about then... When you sanction non-female male marriages, does that defile marriage? I try to put it in a way to incorporate anything other than male-female marriage, because that's the 
definition of marriage, historically, not just from the Bible, from, but historically, it's one man and one woman. And anything other than that, are you defiling marriage? Yes. How about then adultery? Well, obviously, that defiles the marriage. Because it's one man and one woman, and they pledge what? Faithfulness to each other for a lifetime. Okay? And so when that happens, you've defiled this union or of marriage, this, this, this basis of society that God has built up. Now, how about lust, which I'm going to call unfaithfulness in the heart. Now, why would I say that? What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 5? So you've heard it said, that thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whoever lusts after woman in his heart has already committed adultery. Because that lust is not just noticing. It's not just looking. It's saying, I would if I could, but I know I can't, so I won't. I sure wish I could. You understand what the person's saying? Because they imagine the act. They might fantasize about the act, but they know they couldn't because they'd get in trouble and lose their position or whatever. But where does all sin really start? In the heart. Now, be careful. We're not saying you can divorce people because they lust in their heart because <laughs> adultery is a cause for divorce. But Jesus is saying, you need to check adultery at its origin, and it starts where? Right here. And so that defiles marriage. I know a situation, and uh, we're trying, Ann and I were trying to patch this couple together, and it wasn't here in this congregation. And, and, and the man in the, the relationship confessed in front of us and to his wife, says, yeah, I admit that when we were in bed enjoying the sexual union, I was thinking about your sister. Now, how are you going to fix that one? All right. Uh, how do you rip someone's else heart out and stomp on it more than that? Well, they're, they're divorced to this day. And it's lust. It's lust. It defiles it. Now, pornography. Um, I have it under here. Does it defile the marriage bed? Defile marriage? Is it really the same of bringing someone into your marriage? Because adultery, you're bringing another party into your marriage. You're like, no, I'm not. It's not a threesome or something like that. But no, you, you are holding hands and adulterating this marriage. That's what adulterate means, to bring a, a foreign element into it. It's like when a food is adulterated, what does that mean? It's no longer pure. Something is brought into it to adulterate it, right? In pornography, it... Uh, defiles the marriage on both counts. It is adultery because you're lusting in your heart after this uh, digital woman or man, as we're going to see, that your spouse cannot compete with. And it defiles the marriage. It's interesting. Uh, divorce is the last one. Does it defile a marriage? I mean, it's the last one. And it's so usually divorce usually is a product of the above. Usually. Not always. So I want to talk about this one, uh, pornography, because we're going to have to have some classes on it. And I'll have to talk to the elders how to do this. Because I I've, I've presented them twice at other congregations, uh, uh, all day Saturday and a Sunday series. And we think it's sometimes just a male issue, and this comes from Fight the New Drug. There's, there's a lot of people on board on how problematic this is. But this is from 2019. Survey finds that more than one in three women watch porn at least once a week. It's not just a male problem. And here's one I also want to show you. Men who started watching pornography partway through a two-year period doubled their chances of divorce. And for women, it tripled their chance of divorce. See why I say it defiles the marriage? Because it changes your mindset. 
You start bringing in things you see into the marriage and trying to act them out. And so I have to talk to the wives, first of all. Don't let your husbands lie to you and say, this will spice up the marriage. No. We have to trust God and be thankful to him that he, he understands marriage is beautiful in itself. And the union between a man and woman is the most beautiful thing that he's blessed us with. And it doesn't need to be spiced up unless there's something wrong already. And they're lying to you when they say it because they're already deceived themselves when they're thinking that's the case, when they want to introduce this into the marriage. Now, second thing that happens, people, what they see in the pornographic world, they want to introduce it into the marriage. Whether they bring the pornography itself, they want to introduce what they see. And that ends up degrading the marriage. And the reports we see it, and the women feeling like, I'm not comfortable with this, but if, I, if I'm a, a loving wife, and if I'm going to be supportive, supportive and submissive, do I have to? No. How do you please God? How do you please God? By faith. And if you doubt, what have you just done? Sin. Sin. So say, no, I'm not going to engage in this. Because it has to be pure. Now, how can we, as Christians, honor marriage? Because if you can defile it, you can hold it in honor. And we want to leave it on positive. All right? Does that make sense? And so the first thing, stay sexually pure for your marriage. Now, Parents, it starts with you talking to your kids about this. And because we don't have, well, except for the real little ones, <laughs> any kids, they're all in the back. They have to stay sexy. Well, isn't that kind of a, a, a Victorian kind of antiquated idea of saving yourself for marriage? Well, the statistics show that people that have a sex before marriage, before they're ready, have a higher rate of divorce, all right? They have problems in their marriage sexually often because of promiscuity before it. And we'll have to talk about that extensively, but that's one way you, you can honor marriage is say, I'm going to wait because when we engage in sex before marriage, we're stealing. We're stealing from ourselves. The real blessings that sex has in marriage, when it's guilt-free and it's between people that already love each other and made a commitment for life to each other, that's when it's beautiful. We're stealing from our future spouse, aren't we? The gift of myself the first time this union with them. I'm stealing from the person that I'm engaging in immorality with because I'm robbing them of their purity, aren't I? And I am robbing them, stealing from their future spouse because they will no longer be pure. It's really stealing because of, you know, lust and selfishness. Now, is it difficult? Is it challenging? That's why Paul said it's better to marry than burn. If you're in love and you can't control yourself, get married today. Don't have long engagements, things like that. But we have to teach purity to our children. Second of all, realize that marriage is a gift from God. A lot of people think marriage is just useless and it's antiquated, it's of no value. No, when was marriage introduced? Before sin into the world or after? Excuse me? And so are, are we in a, a place of paradise or we're in a fallen world when marriage is introduced? It's part of paradise. God said it's not good for man to be alone. So he created a, a, a partner, and so they're perfectly compatible, perfectly opposite, but perfectly compatible. And he only can find wholeness completely with a male and a female. And God said, good, it's good, it's great. He said, it's very good. So that's why you got to leave your father and mother, and the two become one flesh, they cleave to each other. It's a beautiful thing. Coming from the very mind and heart of God. And so realize it's a gift from God. And sex and marriage is not dirty. It's not something to be ashamed of. It's not something to be not talked about. It's pure and it's honorable because who made it? 
the holy God. And what is he saying? Honor marriage and keep the bed, the union, undefiled. Honor it. Lock it up between yourselves. Under lock and key because it's so precious. You don't want to dis defile it with any of those other things. So that's uh, the third way. The fourth way is stay sexually pure before your marriage, but you can honor marriage by staying sexually pure in your marriage. Now, this is hard, too. It's really challenging. Let's define sexual purity. Because before marriage, people think, well, sexual purity is just abstinence. Well, what's abstinence? Well, we didn't go all the way. Oh, that means you did everything up to it. Well, yeah, I'm still a virgin. Well, sexual immorality doesn't have to just include going all the way. It includes everything up to it as well. But often we carry that into marriage. No, I haven't defiled my marriage. I haven't been unfaithful because I'm still sexually pure because I've never slept with another woman or another man. Oh, really? Is that the standard or criteria of sexual purity? That you flirt, you lust, maybe you view pornography? Are you being pure under the guise, well, I haven't slept with anyone? Is that sexual purity? Of course not. There's a higher standard. So how are we going to have a working definition? I'll give you one. You are sexually pure when your sexual gratification or any type of pleasure comes from your spouse only and not from anyone else or any other thing. That's sexual purity in God's eyes. Notice I said anyone else or any other thing. From your spouse and your spouse only. You say, wow, that's a high standard. So what if I'm not married? Well, that goes back to one. <laughs> Just abstain. Run. It, what does Paul say in 1 Corinthians 1 or 6? Flee fornication. Because every man who sin, that a man, how does it say, Dean? <laughs> every other sin. What does it say? Whoever commits fornication sins against his body, his himself. Yeah. It's something defiles yourself, and then it ends up defiling the marriage. So he says, run! It's so dangerous and destructive. So that's how we stay pure. The last one is, understands God's beautiful design for marriage. I just want to read from you um, Ephesians chapter 5, because we have to talk about how beautiful it is and just get that enmeshed in our minds so we, we, we hold it in its proper place. Now, in chapter 5, marriage is likened unto Christ and the, the church. And so the words are, are quite beautiful as... You could not describe the marriage relationship any, per, per, you know, prettier than this. Prettier. <laughs> Chapter 5. I'll just start in, with husbands because that's where he talks about Christ. He said, husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Why? That he might sanctify her. That makes her just holy and blameless having cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word, that he might present to himself the church. That's his right. And all are glorious. It's, it's, it's a place of glory. Having no spot or wrinkle. That's purity, isn't it? That she should be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. Because he who loves his wife loves himself. When you make marriage what it ought to be, you're not just loving your wife, you're loving yourself, loving your family. For no one hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one. He said, this mystery is great. It's great. Not that it can't be understood. It's just a wonderful mystery, this union that you only can experience when you're there. And that's what he's talking about. Now, 
Forgiveness is always there. When we mess up and defile it, is there forgiveness available? What do we have to do? Repent, that means a change of mind. Confess our sins, and is God faithful to forgive us? Are there consequences often? Yes. But I don't want everyone thinking, well, I haven't been pure. Well, just start today being pure. Start today in everything, okay? Any questions about that? That was my sermon and lecture on marriage. <laughs> I noticed there wasn't any questions. Huh? All right. Hey, any questions? <laughs> well, I, did, I figured I'd just have to say it and go on. Yes? Well, I think it's a, there is a commentary on our culture. Yes. For many years, the culture basically tried to value marriage. And we did it with tax breaks for marriage. Sure. People. We did it with all kinds of things. We are becoming a culture that no longer values marriage, and there are many situations in which people find themselves that they say, because of the tax breaks that are available, I need to divorce. So yeah. I, it, it's sad. They, they yeah. tend to remain married, married uh, but legally go through the fiction of a divorce. And I, I think there is a dishonor that comes on marriage when we do that. Exactly. It's, it's accepting the fact that this is valuable enough that I'm willing to pay for it. Yeah. I know two situations, one in the church, one outside, the exact same scenario. One, they don't marry because of tax reasons, because they lose um, retirement benefits. Yeah. And the other one is similar. You know, and so it's, it's yes. The culture is shifting away from pro-marriage because it in affects the society we live in. Um, did you realize when it comes to pornography, 80 to 90% of it is viewed on a, a mobile phone? If your kids or grandkids have them, you need to have blocks on them. I know some people have flip phones. That's because there is no internet connection. They can text and that's it. Why? We well, say, well, that's being kind of, no, we have souls at at stake. Because when they get caught up in this, sometimes there's no out. And so we have to be aware and not be embarrassed. And like, oh, we don't want to talk. It's a real problem, society. And we have to wake up to it because it's happening in our own households. Yes. Yeah. His friend's house, yeah. Together. And so preventative, yeah, um, that's good to do blocks and all that, but I think it's, it's where um, the good work is really going to come in is having, like, honest discussions about it and, have, and, and opening a dialogue about it, which um, I imagine would be awkward for the parent and for the child, um, but it needs to be done because to them it's just like they're just they're interested in it. That's right. They don't that's right. Into. They just know they're interested in it. They're drawn to it because, in a way, that's how God made them to be. Curiosity, yes. Yeah. It's natural. It's, exactly. So um, it's about educating them, like, like telling them the things that you're saying, like, hey, do you realize how this is going to impact your future marriage, or do you understand how this affects your brain? Because there's more and more data coming out how it really is something to grow. And, it is. Uh, yeah. It hardwires your brain like any addictive drug. Yes, it can. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know if you heard that. Blocks don't help on the phone necessarily because the kids can circumvent it. They go to their friend's house. Hey, look at this. They're going to get introduced to it. And the best solution is to have a conversation, even though that's really hard. And I had friends yeah. that had blocks on their phones, but they knew how to get around the blocks, yeah. which that really solves the problem with their parents because their parents are totally, uh, they think the block is there. Okay, good. It's problem dealt with, but they know how to get around right. it. So the parent's not asking them about it at all. That's right. That's right. Did you hear that? Yeah, the kids, they're savvy enough. They know how to get around them. It's not fun, but we have to talk about it. Why? Because 
God talks about it. It's been a universal problem since time began. And it just becomes more sophisticated, but it's the same story, just a different script. All right? Okay. Um, it's interesting. He goes from love or sex to money. <laughs> Probably the two biggest vices in the world. If it's not sex, it's money. So it's not, it's not just by coincidence. He just The next thing he says is, now we're talking about acceptable sacrifices, right? And there's a sacrifice in honoring marriage, but it's worth it. And it makes us pleasing to God because we're coming from a place of faith. The same way when it comes to money. because there's, So there's always a desire to have more. And so the Bible calls that love of money. It's one Greek word and really means the love of silver, but it's then compound word. It means to have the love of, of money. Uh, in Ephesians, Paul calls covetousness, which is an inordinate desire to have more, he says, really, it amounts to idolatry. Why would he call it idolatry? When you're seeking more, it's called covetousness. Whether it's money or stuff, just material thing. Yes, because it just keeps your eyes off of God and onto stuff. And usually because you put your trust and confidence in what they will do, for, the stuff will do for you, rather than God will. And that's really the essence of adultery. Idolatry. You're giving power to this wealth or whatever it is to sustain you and keep you. Now, if you go to third world countries, they're going to say, well, yeah, because we don't have any. But it's interesting. There's this kind of this rule. The more you have, the more you want. It's just something that's endemic to every person, it seems like. So when we talk about the love of money, we know it's dangerous. The Bible full of uh, verses. Jesus said you can't serve God in money. You just can't. It's not possible. We find that three that elders, you know, they can't be drunkards, they can't be willful, but they can't be lovers of money. It's, it's, it's a mark of a mature Christian that's got himself disciplined. In chapter 6 of the same book, he says the love of money is not the root, but it is a root of all sorts of evil. And many, because of this craving, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves. They've lost their souls because they've been seeking some type of, uh, of, of rest in, in money and stuff rather than God. Uh, the last one in 2 Timothy chapter 3, when it talks about how in the later times things are going to go from bad to worse, and he's describing... It's ungrateful. Oh, that's an interesting word because we're being talk about being grateful. But right in the middle of it, there'll be lovers of self, lovers of money. So it's something that's always afflicted mankind. So we shouldn't be surprised if God says, I want you to be grateful. And I don't want you to be a lover of money. Well, what am I going to substitute that with? Let's go back and look at the text. Let your character, the word character means your lifestyle. Now, do you know someone that's a, love of, a lover of money? You just know them, right? Just like you know an angry person, you know it's a person that's selfish or a person that's loving or kind. You kind of know, ah, that guy's, that's all they're interested in is money, all right? So let your character, your inward disposition, who you are that defines you, let it be free from the love of money. Now, that's that word, it's A, which negates it. The word phileo, remember Philadelphia? All right, love of, of silver. So not, the A negates it, not a lover of money. So it's one compound word. We have three words, but it's just one Greek word. Well, what's the solution? Well, we're going to get to that, but there's that law of getting and wanting that we talked about. It's interesting. God made a promise. Be content. Why? Because God said... He swore with an oath, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Now that's in Deuteronomy, and when Joshua is given the charge to take the promised land, he says, don't be afraid. He says, I will never desert you, I will never forsake you. So let's look at it. The word content, 
literally it comes from a word means to raise a barrier, that you're not going to allow outside influences affect you. And so you're internally sufficient. You're content where you are. And we'll kind of describe that with the little time we have. But I want you to see this. What does all our coinage say? And that's all the Hebrew writer is saying. Trust God and not money. Now, if it's a penny, like, what can I trust in a penny to do for me? Oh, but a $100 bill, that's a lot better, right? I get a lot done with 100 But what does it say on it, too? In God, I trust. And I want you to think about it. Every time we handle money, because that's what we're saying, he says, be free from the love of money. And what's the solution, the counter? Be content with what you have. This displaces this. And we have to see that. Exodus, when they complained and God provided a manna, how much were they supposed to pick of that manna off the ground? One day's ration only. And if they gathered more, it melted and got wormy. Why? One day's only. He's, huh? He gave it to you today. Trust him that he'll give it to you. Why would you gather tomorrow's portion today? Because you're trusting in the stuff, the food, rather than the God who gave it. And that's the lesson he was trying to teach them. There was one exception. Friday, you gather two days portion because you don't gather on the Sabbath. But one day and one day only, trust God. That's why he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you, food, shelter, and clothing. Don't be anxious, anxious for tomorrow. Today's got enough problems itself. You just worry about today. God will take care of tomorrow. So that's what it is. And so be free. Freedom is found in finding contentment in what you have. And it's found by trusting God. One more and we're done, this slide. Here's myself. I want you to see this verse broken down. Be free from the love of money. Isn't that what it says? Somehow free yourself from that, that, that slavery to it. And that's this desire and the opportunity we have always to have more. It's there. We can have more if we just work harder. True? The solution is be content with what you have. This has to do with what I want. This has to do with what I have right now. See the contrast? And how, what makes me free? It's not myself. It's God. The basis for my contentment is I will never desert you. I will never forsake you. I'm here. You don't have the extra money. Don't worry about tomorrow because I'm here when? Today. Isn't that beautiful? It's trusting God rather than stuff. It's trusting God and money. It's coming from a place of faith. And the last one he'll say is right here. So we confidently say, the Lord is my helper. The one that rushes my aid, that's what that word means in the time of need. So I'm not going to fray. What's man going to do to me? The Lord is my helper. There's no reason ever to fear anything. So we'll finish right there. Thank you.